Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is entrepreneur Dolph Zantinga. The topic today is both important and dear to Paul's heart, water, health, and our future. Paul has been searching for someone with a deep expertise in water for some time, and through connections from students and colleagues, he found Dolph. Dolph is an entrepreneur with a background in fiber optics, telecommunication, artificial intelligence, and data mining. He has conducted extensive research on photonics, physiology, light, and water. His company created the Analemma Water Wand, a highly effective, affordable, portable tool anyone can use to structure water, making it coherent and optimal for all body-mind functions. Dolph is passionate about providing holistic and natural solutions to counter the impact of electromagnetic radiation on our health and consciousness. In today's episode, Paul and Dolph have a deep, meaningful dialogue on many subjects, including artificial intelligence and its pros and cons. Once Paul realized that Dolph was one of the original developers of AI, he couldn't resist asking his opinions on the potential risks of AI. They talk about the issues of using algorithms to control people's spending patterns, game and media addictions, as well as their thoughts, values and emotions. Paul and Dolph also take an honest look at the limitations of biohacking devices and how they ultimately weaken access to innate abilities within all human beings. They also discuss how AI has not only triggered a degeneration of the quality of music, but Dolph shares how AI can use music as yet another means of controlling people. Moving on to the topic of water, Paul and Dolph discuss what water does in nature and in our bodies, where the water on earth comes from, the difference between dead water and living water, the difference between incoherent and coherent water, and what Gerald Pollock's fourth phase of water is. Dolph shares more about the Analemma water wand, how it was developed, what it does, and why it is a very important tool to have in anyone's health toolkit today. They talk about what happens to seeds when watered with structured water versus unstructured water, and how farming chemicals damage the ability of the DNA in seeds to function properly, producing poor quality food. They look at water's essential connection to light via biophotons, to the microorganisms in the soil, to your gut microbiome, and more. Dolph shares shocking facts about what happens to water when exposed to 4G and 5G EMF radiation and what the massive increase in 5G antennas and satellites ultimately means to the health of all living species from the microorganisms to plants, trees, animals and man. Paul and Dolph dialogue on water's influence on our psychology in reference to Harold Saxonburg's groundbreaking water research at Yale University in the late 1940s a discussion sure to make you think deeply about the importance of water in ways seldom pondered today. This may be one of the deepest, most informative podcasts on water and related issues, and is sure to be one that you'll want to share. By the end of the podcast, you'll also be very clear as to why we need to protect our water resources at all costs. And to do that, we must also protect our soils, effectively regulate large corporations, get morality back into science, and even voice our legitimate concerns over filling our skies with dangerous satellites. Enjoy the deep wisdom of Dolph Zantinga. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. I'm excited to share our guest today. Our title is Water, Health, and Our Future with Dolph Zantinga. And I'm really excited to share Dolph with you. Dolph is an entrepreneur with a background in fiber optics, telecommunication, artificial intelligence, and data mining. Early in his career, he co-founded Syllogic an international IT firm in the domains of AI, machine learning, and database management systems. After Sologic, he was acquired by Perot Systems. Dolph was European director for that company. Later, he was the director of IT at KPN, the largest Dutch telecom company. He founded the Unchaired Unit, one of the first fiber fiber optics company in Europe. From a heavy, uh, tech-heavy career, Dolph's career took an unusual turn when he pursued the study of Chinese medicine, acupuncture, and delved into the impact of electromagnetic frequencies on biological systems. This led to further research on photonics, physiology, light, and water. He partnered with Dr. Eric uh, Larker, 
I believe, to develop the technology to create full spectrum coherent water and measure its positive effects on biological systems. He's passionate about providing holistic and natural solutions to counter their impact, uh, to counter the impact of electromagnetic radi uh, radiation on our health and consciousness. And just so I don't forget to mention it, which I, I don't usually forget, but to let you know up front, Dolph's website is analemma-water.com. So A-N-A-L-E-M-M-A. -M -M -A. And I actually came across Dolph from uh, a variety of sources, but I couldn't remember exactly which one. I've had a few of my students share his very impressive water device for structuring water, which we'll talk about and share with you. And I also have had uh, students bring it up to me, show it to me in classes and inspire me to check it out and check Dolph out. And um, I just checked in with some of my friends and Dolph, one of my buddies, who's a, uh, uh, he's our family OBGYN, has his own podcast and uh, is a pretty damn sharp guy, told me he was just at a party where the people there had your uh, analemma pen and they were using it and they did a, a blind taste test and they used the pen against several different waters i guess with six people and a hundred percent of them could tell which one had the analemma used on it that is that is very very interesting yeah so i thought that was pretty cool because you know not everybody's sensitive enough to vibration to really feel or taste the change in the structure of the water um i've been working with these things for many years so i'm i can feel it right away but uh to have people that aren't initiated into that kind of sensitivity be able to figure it out first try is pretty good. <laughs> I, I listened to your podcast with Tom Cowan and I really loved it. And, uh, you know, I was doing some research just to learn more about you and, and, you know, what I thought would be the most important things to talk about today. And you guys covered a lot of really great stuff. So I've kind of taken some notes and structured our, uh, dialogue around that. I'd love it, Dolph, if you can share an overview of your journey from the world of computer tech, AI, and fiber optics into the world of biophoton and water research, and what it is that made you so interested in water, because I, I really love that story uh, that you shared with Tom Cowan, and it's very unusual for a guy with your background <laughs> to end up running Fritz Pop's lab, I was like, wow, <laughs> they, they must really be impressed by Dolph to, to let him run the whole lab. And I thought your story of how you taught these guys to think outside of the box was just beautiful. Well, I, I love to tell you that story. Uh, yes, my career started in the IT. As a matter of fact, I worked uh, for many years also in California. And uh, that is why I love that area. Mm. And uh, we were one of the first developers in the artificial intelligence in the world. It was more than 30 years ago. And uh, but due to computer science, you started to, uh, to get more and more involved upon what is data and what does it mean? And that in itself is already one part of the block uh, in this story, because data, as, as what we see, is very often very limited. Due to the data mining, we were suddenly involved that data is a much broader sense uh, but due to data mining i found that there are certain patterns patterns in data that you can hardly uh, find with normal statistics uh, on top of that uh, when i was a very young man i started to do or uh, practice already yoga in many areas so i was quite familiar also with energies because i could could send some of those energies myself and uh, when I uh, started to work in the uh, area of telco, uh, I was uh, introducing fiber optics. The beauty of fiber optics is that uh, you work with light and you beam light with the speed of light through these fiber optics. So that was more or less the second step that I worked with, uh, with light, different types of light. And then the third thing that uh, took place is that I noticed that uh, on top of the light, you can build in certain frequencies, 
for instance, if you have a radio, you receive certain waveforms and the same is with television. So what we did is that we beam not only light, but we also put data on the light. And that all together uh, was for me one very big step. Then I thought, hey, how is modern nature work? Is modern nature also working with light? And how does nature work with data? And they do it also with rhythms, but that is something I didn't know at that moment of time. So uh, what I what I did at the very beginning, I uh, I was in a in a very lucky position that I met some of the people of the uh, Professor Pop Laboratory, and I spoke with these guys upon energies, and they were really surprised upon how we looked to it. And I said uh, I want to do some tests over there and uh, see if we can find certain frequencies. And normally they do a very uh, they look to a specific area, but in this case, I wanted to look to a much broader area of light. And I did also some tests then with fiber optics, and I showed them that each frequency of the light can also transfer different types of data. And that was also for them a completely different way of thinking. So I introduced new ways of thinking uh, over there as well. And then uh, after the test, uh, I could really see that the, the light in the light forms is data as well. So we found out how do you collect this data of the biophotons and what does it mean? So suddenly data, and that was, of course, for me, one of the base steps, became a very important thing as well to, to see how nature works. And then we looked to light. And then I switched over to multiple light forms as well. And then I could see that with Fritz Pop, his laboratory, I could go very deep and I got a lot of information and I loved it. So that is more or less how it started. And then I got, became so enthusiastic. And uh, Paul, one of the things that really, really made for me a, a step forward to take over the laboratory was I saw a, a, a dish and we put seeds in it, just seeds. And when you look to the seeds with the biophotons, you see some light. But then suddenly, at a certain moment in, in this research, you give it a little bit of water. And then you see an explosion of light. And I thought, what is this? But for me, out of the data, I was looking for the data, I saw Jesus, they are communicating with each other. So those seeds suddenly com communicated. And I thought, nobody ever told me on in any biological lesson that seeds can communicate with each other and that they can communicate with with the soil and the water and then i moved on and on and on and then suddenly they said well you're a little bit crazy with your partner uh, but uh, why don't you take over the laboratory and that is what we did that's amazing then we introduced also other light forms, not only the, the visual light that we can see with our seven, seven colors, yes, but we introduced also much more light forms in the ultraviolet area and in the near infrared area. And then we combined it again with data and with algorithms, mathematical algorithms. So the whole base of the data and the visualization and the light, that was more or less already the beginning. Yeah. Um, a couple things I wrote down as you were talking there. One, I forgot to mention to you in our correspondences, I was raised in a self-realization fellowship family. Oh, you're kidding. Yogananda. Yeah. Well, I'm the chairman. I've been a chairman for more than 30 years in Western Europe. Oh, that's great. I, yeah. I, I met most of the Swamis in India and I was there quite often. So I uh, I was initiated by them in, in those Kriya techniques. Yeah, my mother's been to India for initiations three times. She's been so she joined the Self-Realization Fellowship Temple when I was 12, and I spent my summer I did summer camp uh the the it, when I was 15 with the monks and learned all sorts of stuff from them and spent time there and got all my questions answered and so <laughs> I was excited to I forgot to share that with you in our email exchanges but uh you know as a kid I've been I begin having very profound mystical experiences and 
uh, part of that has led to my deep connection with my soul and the ability to feel subtle energies like the energies of water. And so when you were talking about that, I got to crack up when Tom Cowan asked you, are you still in communication with those masters? <laughs> yes. Yep. <laughs> so I said, yeah, that's very good. Of course. Once you make contact, you, if you're wise, you don't let go of it. No, you never want to get rid of that. Never. <laughs> Yeah, that has a serious impact upon our research. Oh, that, yeah. Because if you move to subtle energies, and that is what biophotons do, but if you move to subtle energies, you start to understand that our view of the world is so limited. And uh, you don't want to get to this limited world. You want to expand that. Yes. Yeah. And a couple of other things. Um, are you familiar with Cleve Baxter's work? Uh, I heard his name, but oh, please don't. Cleve Baxter was featured in The Secret Life of Plants by uh, Christopher Tompkins and Peter Bird. Yeah. And uh, he uh, he is, uh, he did tons of research, but a lot of his research is really mind-blowing. For example, he showed, he hooked his, he's, he's the pioneer of the whole lie detector system, the polygraph test. And he taught the, you know, all the government agencies how to use it, but he used it to do research on plants and all sorts of living things. I'm bringing this up because it's very relevant to your explorations of water and how the seeds communicated. But he showed, for example, he could put his lie detector test down inside the drain on the sink where there was bacteria. And then as soon as he would move towards it with a kettle of hot water, they would all start freaking out and the lie detector test would just go crazy. And he found that they already knew what he was thinking. He could hook it to plants and just think thoughts like, I'm going to burn you. And if he brought a lighter near it, the plants would all get scared. He hooked his lie detectors to his polygraph to a dozen of eggs. And then when he reached to grab one to put it into a pot of boiling water, they all freaked out. And he showed that the eggs were communicating to each other and knew when one was in trouble. Uh, he took yogurt, just standard like yogurt from the store, put one batch, uh, uh, a couple scoops into a test tube, had his research assistant drive about 40 or 50 miles away. And then he had his polygraph hooked up to the yogurt in the container that it came from the store in his laboratory. And he said, now hold a lighter up to the yogurt in the test tube. In the instant that he held that lighter to the test tube, the polygraph test registered a complete stress response in the yogurt in his laboratory 50 miles away. I'm not surprised. I'm really, it is very exciting, by the way, what you just uh, told me, but it is exactly in line with our own research. And uh, if you start to understand how we treat the soil and the plants and the seeds, then you think we do something completely wrong. Yeah. I've got uh, a few books loaded with this kind of research. When we're done with the podcast, I'll share them with you and I'll try to remember to put them in the podcast notes. Please do. Yeah. Um, one of them's by Stone. It's The Secret Life of secret the secret life of the cell by stone is the last name and it's a book full of this kind of research and it shows beyond a shadow of a doubt even the bacteria all over this planet are in connection with each other at all times yeah yep. every single bit of it yeah it's very good research to be aware of um also, while I was listening to your interview, I wondered if, are you familiar with Ibrahim Karim and biogeometry? Yeah. Good, because uh, that has a profound effect on water itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I found, um, as I mentioned to you in an email, I found when I was charging my water that it changed with every cycle of the moon, and I could True. feel and taste it. And when the moon was full, it it was just like carbonated water. It would like bubble on your tongue. And when we're at the new moon, 
it tasted so empty, almost like distilled water that felt like it would go right through your tongue or your mouth when you would drink. It literally felt like it was penetrating your body very quickly. But once we put biogeometry in the house, so I'd bring the bottles in from outside, it smoothed it out so I couldn't tell the differences in the moon cycle, which was very interesting, but it had a very good charge on it. The, because the centering energy of biogeometry takes anything that's high and brings it down, anything that's low that brings it up to create a sort of homeostatic centering effect, I found it was quite profound how it affected the water. So I, I realized that if I wanted to use water with specific moon energies, such as new moon water for detoxification or full moon water for like, like a... a a natural replacement for a stimulant like coffee or a tea that I uh, probably need to not put it in the biogeometry because it seemed to center the water so everything was perfectly even. What, what you bring up is very profound and very important. Uh, i tell you a little bit what we did with uh, moon cycles. Uh, we tested this on, uh, on plants and we measured the plants with the biophotons for, for multiple weeks, and we used different types of water. And for us, it was a serious uh, shock, Paul, because we thought that uh, what we call very good water is hardly responding in the most efficient way to the moon cycle. And But what we found out is uh, with the, the device that you just discussed, when we put it through the device, then suddenly we saw a moon cycle so perfect with the moon and it was a beautiful upcoming line and a downcoming line. And we thought, what is up and what is down and what is up and down? And that took place within a few hours and we didn't know what it was. But suddenly with the data and the data mining, we found out that suddenly when there is a fantastic moon cycle, you have the low and the high tide coming ah. back. So it's creating an electromagnetic fluctuation. Fantastic. It was, for us, an amazing experience. And in New Moon, what we thought, saw is that suddenly there is an explosion of new energy. It is really like as, as if all the energy of the last month is coming through the water again. And you see an explosion and energy difference between 4 to 20 times into the plant as well. Wow. And that will take hours. And then suddenly it's gone. And then a new curve starts. So there, there is a whole rhythm that we are not aware of. And that is related to the moon. Yes. You know, here's, uh, I'll repeat the story that I wrote to you in an email just so people can hear it. You know, my water chargers are built on, on the ground, on dirt. And my new one, as I showed you the pictures of, did you get to see the pictures I sent you? Yeah, I saw yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So the new one's got a stone floor, but the water's in glass bottles, you know, five gallon glass bottles. The bottles themselves weigh about 10 pounds. It's thick, like almost a centimeter thick of glass. And so I would go out and I would pull a bottle out of the charger and I would taste it. And sometimes it tasted just like dirt. Sometimes it tasted like nickel or, or like a metallic taste. And so sometimes it had no taste, but the energy was just like, a, like I was saying, so high. It was like, wow, it's almost like I was drinking, uh, you know, something that was stimulating me, you know, like a caffeinated beverage or something. It didn't have that kind of caffeine buzz, but it was like, wow, there's a lot of energy. You can feel it just blow your field right open. And so I was meditating on this, and then I just happened to go out the following day, and it was late at night, and it just happened to be a full moon night. And I said to my soul, what is making water taste like this? Because there's no way these minerals are getting through that glass bottle. And so I thought about it, and my soul turned my head and made me look at the moon, and I went, Oh, it's the moon. And my soul said, yes. And my soul said, buy a moon calendar, track the changes in the water every time you pull it out. And so I've been doing that for many, many years now. And what I found out is very interesting. 
the full moon energies are easiest to track because they're the strongest, but they change each month. So sometimes, even though sometimes the water is almost carbonated, sometimes it's not, it still has high energy, but I noticed that the taste changes. So you get these different flavors in the water and it's not, it's more, what I've vision is it's more of a spiral pattern not a circle pattern, meaning if we just did the, the 28 days of the moon cycle as a circle, then the water would taste the same every time you were at that cycle. But what I found is it must be on a spiral pattern that's being affected because as we're moving through the cosmos in relationship to different constellations and maybe even the constellations of the zodiac, it's causing the water to change perpetually. That's it, uh, Paul. You're going through the elements. You're going through the elements of the zodiac. Yeah. And, and each element is giving a different taste to the water. So what you just described is exactly in, in line with Mother Nature. Yes. And so it, it was very, very um, interesting to me. But one of the things that I share with people when they come visit me and my students and i do courses on how to build these water chargers i've built many of them for people one of my clients had a, a penthouse flat on, in manhattan on top of a huge building and i constructed a water charger for him and i built it uh at a, a big place uh, where they sell bedrock and uh, boulder and stones, and they have a wide acres and acres of stones, including exotic crystals and everything. So what I did is I built it there so I could hand select the stones and let my soul guide me. And I took pictures of every step. And then I shipped him the entire crate of like, you know, almost probably three quarters of a ton of stone. And then he reassembled it step by step on his, on his patio, uh, on his rooftop, uh, patio in downtown Manhattan, and it worked perfectly. But uh, there was a point I was going to make, and it slipped my mind. But I, I was just noticing that these energies were constantly changing. Oh yes, but what what I wanted to share because I really wanted to hear your your response to this. I tell people when you drink the water out of my water charger, you are getting a software update to every bit of information coming from the microorganisms in the soil, from the tree roots, from the fungi, from the bacteria, from the viruses, from the sunlight, from the moonlight, because this charger acts like an amplifier. And you can literally feel the vortex of energy spinning when you stand inside of it. And so I think that, that um, working with nature and using structured water, because uh, one, the, the effects of getting that software update keeps you totally balanced with the environment, which I think for things like our sense of intuition and our feeling nature, like our sense of feeling when the weather is going to change or how animals can tell when an earthquake is coming. I think if we're updated through the water, that we are much more um, intimate with the messages nature's trying to give us that normally wouldn't be on the cognitive radar but would be in the intuitive range i was curious what you thought of that i fully agree with you paul uh, sometimes we uh, we think that uh, water is just one of the elements but let's face reality of all the molecules in your body 99 percent of all your molecules are water molecules and uh, 70 percent of the body weight is the water. Sometimes we forget that most most part of our body is water, and water is an antenna. Yes, I just wrote the word antenna on my paper to talk to you about yeah. that. Yeah, it, it's simply an antenna. So if you are going to connect your antenna to a wide area of frequencies, then it picks up those frequencies. And then, and the only thing, uh, Paul, what I, I would recommend, maybe you uh, give it a try. Yeah. Because I heard you telling me that you are using glass. Uh, maybe use uh, also maybe uh, something with quartz. Yes, I, I, I've got to look into that. I, I know they make quartz containers for laboratories, but I don't know if they make them five gallons or three oh, gallons. Just, just give it a try and then see if it uh, makes a difference. The reason is very simple. Uh, normal glass is blocking in, in some area 
infrared light or uh, ultraviolet light. Yes, ultraviolet light. And the ultraviolet is really the messenger. Then it comes in. And the infrared is an other form of light. But uh, if you can use the uh, quartz, give it a try. I'm going to research that. Um, just writing that down. Because also quartz glass is very similar to the structure of water itself. Yes, that's uh, a, a, an interesting thing because that would bring it into harmony as an antenna working in parallel with another antenna or in series, however you wanted to think about it. That's it. Yeah. Very interesting. You know, so this brings up a thought I wanted to ask you. One, the analemma pen is highly structured from all the, I read your whole website and have talked to people, as I mentioned. And I, and uh, of course, we're going to talk about this a lot more in the podcast, but it's coming to me to ask you this now. What this brings up in me is, A, the analemma as a highly structured, we'll call it a very coherent antenna system. If you structure your water, say you're, whatever you're drinking in your cup or a whole bottle of it, wouldn't that essentially tap that person right into the environmental frequencies that we're talking about, like the moon and the sun? Because it's turning the water that they're drinking into an interface? That's true. But there is a but in it. It depends a little bit upon the person. If he's also drinking two liters of alcohol that day, and uh, he's going to the fast food, and he loves that as well, then it takes a little bit longer, Paul. Yeah, of course, yes. But, you know, so let me say it another way. Take the person out of it. If we, if we had instrumentation sensitive enough to measure the information flowing into and out of water, and we just took, a, say, a bottle of water from the store or even tap water and measured what information is coming through it with a sensitive enough computer system and then used the analemma pen, wouldn't that significantly almost be like fine-tuning the system for a broader range of frequencies? Absolutely, and that is why we call it the full spectrum. But the beauty of this, Paul, is that that person, when he is going to become a personal antenna himself, when he is using the stick to very often, then he is also going through the same moon cycles as you just described. So the, the, that person is also going to change with every new moon through the whole year. Yeah. And that is a very interesting experience. Yes. I'm because I've been doing this for so long, I feel very tuned to the environment. And, um, you know, we live out, you know, there's, you know, it's a, it's a walk away to, to anybody's house. We're in the middle of a 14 acre piece of land. So lots of time I lift stones and bare feet all the time. And the kids run around barefoot and we're gardening. And so because of the way we live, I feel, um, I feel very tapped into the cosmos, I would say, you know, of course the solar system, but I feel um, that this use of the water I have and the way that we live is giving me more grounding and more centering energy to help through the kind of crisis we're going through in the world. So I often wish the kids especially, but all the people that are so disconnected and so uh, constantly being bombarded by electromagnetic frequencies of all sorts of negative types, realized how important it is just to get your feet on the earth and, and live more in tune with nature so you don't get lost. Oh, is it that normal for a human being? I mean, isn't that the first lesson we have to teach our kids? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and isn't that the first lesson on school? <laughs> Which one? <laughs> stay, yeah, yeah. Stay, stay connected? <laughs> yeah, stay, yeah, stay connected. That should be the lesson number one. Yeah, it, I wish it was. You know, turmeric's really, really hot now. There's a lot of scientific research on it, but they're not all created the same. So I brought Autumn Smith on to tell you about Paleo Valley's turmeric complex so you know exactly what the benefits are and why you, like me, should get your turmeric complex from Paleo Valley. Autumn, tell us about your turmeric complex. 
At Paleo Valley, we are big believers in food as medicine. And so turmeric, of course, it has beat drugs out. We know it's anti-inflammatory. We know it has brain benefits. We know it has joint benefits. But what most people don't know is that a lot of turmeric supplements only contain one isolated compound of turmeric called curcumin. And so what we did instead was create a complex. We added organic turmeric and then ginger and rosemary and clove, which were some of the most DNA protective spices studied. And we created a complex. We added organic coconut powder and pepper for absorption. And so we We've created a really high quality, highly bioavailable turmeric complex that will hopefully help you to feel your best. And all you have to do to check it out is go to paleovalley.com. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com. And you can use the code CHECK15, that's lowercase C-H-E-K-15 to save 15%. I can't resist asking you AI <laughs> questions as soon as I found out about your background because uh, I've been studying AI and I've read a number of books on it and I've actually tracked down a few experts to do a podcast on, but I thought, oh, I've got a chance to talk to an AI expert. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a, a few questions and then we'll jump back into the water thing. Are you all right with AI questions? Go ahead. I got to hear your answer to this. Um, Here's a few questions. I'll take them one at a time. I've studied several books and listened to various podcasts and seen documentaries exploring the pros and cons of AI. And there's clearly two camps among the scientists working in the field of AI, those that see it as a real threat to humanity and the planet in the near future, and those that feel it's a great tool and those that are worrying about it getting out of control or just having fantasies. I'm wondering what your position is. <laughs> Well, maybe maybe both are wrong and both are right. That is uh, the answer. But let me give uh, give me your feedback. Yeah. Um, a lot of people are afraid for artificial intelligence. And why are they so afraid for artificial intelligence? Because we can misuse it in a dramatic way. And uh, we have seen already in the politics how it has been used by uh, some presidents. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and one in the, one in your own country and one in the UK as well. And uh, another thing, and that is of course um, the the incredible dependency on data. Those who really want to use artificial intelligence, they are going to introduce all kinds of uh, rules and regulations so that they can collect your data, your personal data. So there is a lot of things that are. Uh, connected to only the artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is completely based upon the fact that you need a lot of data. Well, there are some multinationals in the world that almost control all the data, especially your personal data. And especially, Paul, if you are going to bring in likes and dislikes, artificial intelligence loves this. If you say likes and dislikes, then that's the cream on the pudding. Yeah, they know how to control your mind from there. And that is exactly what can happen. Uh, we, we found out that mind control with artificial intelligence ain't that difficult at all. As a matter of fact, it's quite easy. So in that respect, I understand where the worry is coming from, especially with the current level of politics and, and behavior of human beings. Uh, we have to take this warning very serious. Uh, can artificial intelligence be a help as a matter of fact i can tell you we cannot run this world without because certain areas take for instance a nuclear power plant can be so become so complex things can go wrong that you need the support of something that can tell you what if if i do a and what if if i do b and uh, also, uh, certain cars con are completely controlled by artificial intelligence so that you stay on track, that an accident cannot happen. So the complexity in the world is increasing. So I say we need both. Yes. I think we, I think we need some uh, rigorous scientific investigation to determine where the edges of safety are and to put some morality into the use of not only artificial intelligence but science 
period. Yeah, well, science can be misused in a dramatic way, and we see that on a day-to-day basis in multiple areas. And uh, with with the control of the data, you can really control this world. And we see it now in certain countries in the world, whereby with also camera imaging and all the control that you have to bring in on your bank account, and especially if you also use uh, all kinds of uh, social media, then you are in full control. Yeah. You're being fully controlled, you mean? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And th- I don't think that that is the plan of being a full human being. Not at all. That, I think the first plan of being a full human being is the lesson that we just discussed, lesson number one, be connected. Yes, and not connected by the internet, connected through what you really are, the universe, the world. Is this uh, the answer? Well, yeah, that's one. Let's go to the next question. Uh, yeah, I, I like your answer. It's balanced. You know, it's not a, a a yay or a nay. It's like we have to, you know, we have to look at it, it, its pros and cons and use it intelligently or it uses us. And I think the, the uses us is the is the real skull and crossbones that we have to be aware of because, you know, so many people in the world today have been raised on computers and, and live on, on a multi, uh, you know, um, social media. So what happens is, and I've actually just produced a video that's in edit right now called the danger of living in two realities. And I show the difference between living in the digital reality and living in connection with the earth and the elements of the earth. And the way I make the comparison is I, I drew a, a, a picture of a tree with its root systems and showed all the elements, the sun, the water, the air, et cetera. And I drew the same thing on a phone. So I said, the whole video compares your relationship to the tree on your phone versus the one in your backyard kind of thing. And the elements on the phone, they're purely ideas, but the ones that you live in are real living elements. And I'm making the point that People can program you to believe things in a digital reality that simply do not interface with the actual reality that we live in in a 3D world. And so I'm making that distinction and that, and I'm bringing that up to make the point that people that get too far into the digital world don't even realize they're being taken over and that what they're being driven to do, which is largely to buy shit, ultimately feeds the destruction of the environment that we're in with too much consumerism and too much materialism. And we can't keep doing that because we're on the very, you know, mother nature's going in needing a CPR right now. (laughs) So if we keep, we keep playing this game, she's going to have a heart attack and, and we're going to be the unlucky victims of our own stupidity. What is your question upon this? Uh, You want me to give a response on this? Because I fully agree with you. Uh, to be honest, one of the things, and that is the tricky things in the whole digital world at the moment, is that we see a lot of addiction. Yes. And suicide. And due to that suicide. And uh, we were at the be- very beginning, 20 years ago, when the digit- uh, digital world really started to uh, to boom, we thought that we would become smarter. Now we are becoming more and more depender- dependent. And uh, in, when I was a young kid, you were walking, you were walking through uh, in, in, in a forest and you were playing on the beach and those things. And now they even do it on a PC, you know? Yes. And you had, you had a lot of kids around you. you. You played with friends. You did football, soccer, everything. You played tennis. And nowadays we only see games. And a lot of these games, and that is also for me a big surprise, they're sometimes extremely aggressive. When you get bonus points, when you kill somebody, and that, and especially when you connect that to an addiction. And uh, I, uh, I met some uh, people in the U.S. who, uh, who uh, had to deal with kids who were completely addicted, and they told me that some of those uh, organizations that are making games, they use MRI scans. In, for certain parts in the games and see how can we create that addiction. That's sad. 
Well, then we move in what I think into a completely wrong behavior. And that is something I really regret that we move in such an area. Yeah, that's that's mind piracy. And uh, well, that is, I think, just the beginning of it. Yes, it's piracy. And you make them addicted. And then you see that uh, one of the, uh, some, some of the big firms in social media, yeah, they use this technology as well. Yeah, they exactly, absolutely. With, they, they come up with advertisements and with sounds so that, that every time when you hear the sound, people are running to the computer or to the mobile phone and you see the, com- the complete addiction where you go to a restaurant nowadays. When we went to a restaurant in the past, everybody was socializing, and now everybody is looking to the mobile phone. Yes. Yeah, it's it's uh, unhealthy. Um, you know, from what I've learned from my research, uh, AI is largely driven by algorithms. And though processing information along uh, with algorithms can be helpful, I find it particularly dangerous when being used to prescribe medicines, hormones, supplements, as well as being the most common means by which biohacking devices create information. The diversity among human beings is so vast, it's safe to say that nobody can be represented by an algorithm. Among the real problems I see with AI technology in this regard is that people turn to data sets overlooking the human element, which has led to uh, modern medicine divorcing itself from the real issues of what creates illness and disease, such as emotions, challenges of being oneself, the challenges of relationships, environmental stressors, and much more. And so the the other real problem I have with AI-driven technologies, which is very common in the biohacking industry, is that I believe, as Steiner stated a long time ago, that we're trying to create technologies outside of ourselves when the superior technology is already inside of ourselves. So every time someone re- relies on a gadget to tell them what their heart rate is, then they lose awareness of paying attention to their own heart rate, their blood pressure, and all the various things that those, there's nothing those devices do that a yogi can't already do in fact you know a a good example i i think i might have shared this story but i'll share it again i remember when yogananda first came to the united states i believe it was in boston he was doing a demonstration and he said are there any doctors in the audience and there was a, a number of them so he brought several of them up on stage and he put one on each radial pulse one on each posterior tibial pulse and one on each carotid pulse And then he said, tell me what the pulse is. And so they all announced the pulse. It was the same. Then he altered the pulses at each location at the same time and said, now tell me what what the pulse is. And they all gave different numbers. And then he was able to rotate the pulses around his body at conscious will. And, you know, skilled yogis have done many, many such things. But why? Because they're using more advanced technology than anything we're creating with these gadgets. So people like Yogananda are showing us what's possible if we just work with the technology that we have. And so I'm real concerned that as more and more people fall into this trap of gadgets, that they actually lose touch with their own human abilities. And I think that leads to a future where children will have no knowledge of how to interface with the world if the power goes out or there's some kind of a crisis. They won't know how to find water. They won't know how to plant. They won't know how to, what foods to eat. They won't, you know, it, it's, it, to me, it points to a very devastating situation because it diminishes human consciousness and makes them relied, uh, reliant upon or addicted to gadgets that are powered by electricity. And it stops them from actually learning And a great simple example that you've probably seen or experienced yourself is if you use a digital clock for a while that just gives you numbers like 10, 10, you can get to the point where you look at an analog clock and you can't remember how to tell time anymore. I've actually had that experience. And the day that happened, I got rid of my digital watch. I said, I don't want that. I don't want to lose connection with the actual flow of the rhythm of time by looking at a digital watch. So there's a very simple example of how quickly our brain will lose a skill by implanting 
something that gives us the information too easily. Not only that, we are also implanting nowadays chips already in human beings. And that is something I really, really don't like at all. And I think uh, what you just uh, mentioned about Jokananda is, are we going only to the external world or do we also move to the internal world? And I think that is uh, something, uh, that answer must be given, I think, within a very short time frame. And I think we will pay a huge price if we only go to the external world. Yeah, exactly, because it's, it halts personal spiritual evolution. Absolutely. And it limits down our view upon who we are and what the world is and the galaxy, what it means. Yes. That's devastating. Uh, and it's sad that we don't have enough people in the public that are conscious enough and aware enough of the realities that we're talking about to even think it think about it from that perspective they just think oh this is going to make my life easier it's going to do this for me it's going to tell me that when in reality uh how long does a machine have to tie your shoe before you don't know how to tie your own shoe anymore you know and and that's a problem my next question is about the death of music many skilled musicians and sound healers including the famous bass player victor wooten as highlighted in his recent book, The Spirit of Music, have been very concerned about the use of algorithms and AI computer technology in the production of music. They all essentially say that this technology is killing the spirit, the meaning and the feeling messages and the experience that music should offer us and is a dangerous form of censorship oriented only toward mass production sales and is being used as a tool like propaganda to cultivate a specific sort of mindset among the listeners. I'm curious what your thoughts are in that regard. Okay, well, it's a very important question. Um, what you do see with music, everybody responds almost in a very short time frame to music. And it can bring an emotion, let's say, in a few, few seconds already. And what you do see is that um, depending upon your own frequency, you have a certain music. When you're young, you, you are more moving towards hard rock yeah. and we get older, you want to have different types of music, you know. Yeah. It's like taste of food. You also want to increase your food as well. Yeah. And what you do see is that if people are getting addicted again to certain rhythms, then they only yet are limited to a limited number of frequencies. Yeah. So in that respect, he's absolutely right. Not only that, due to the fact that music is a very direct frequency, it can have a huge effect direct on your emotion as well. Yes. You can bring in music that creates aggression in a very short time frame. Mantras are based upon this, yes. that, you, that you create a rhythm and a frequency in specific areas. And that is why music should be free. Never, never use it with artificial intelligence. Right. Very, very important. Now, it brings up a thought. I wrote a note while you were sharing there. If we think of the importance of variety in diet and variety of emotional experiences, variety of color exposure, um, for example, the Bates method for better eyesight. Are you familiar with Dr. Bates's a method for better eyesight? No, oh, please don't. Uh, it, it, it's been around since probably the 40s. He was a pioneering eye doctor, but he gave eye exercises and it helped many, many people get rid of their need for glasses and contact lenses. But one of the things he shows is that people living in cities are too limited in the color spectrum. So as part of the healing exercises is eye gazing. And that's just looking out over the horizon. Like I'm looking out at the mountains right now. And I can see my tree with all the fall leaves and the many colors, but he's showing how we need to have a healthy visual system and mental function. We need a variety of colors. And what is color? It's frequency. Yep. So one of the things that concerns me about this is that not only the music, but the all the things we're talking about are actually going to create a, what I would consider to be a frequency starvation diet where we're so disconnected from the variety of frequencies that we get the same negative effects that we do with censorship and that we actually start losing touch 
with all the elements that make a human human. And because all those frequencies carry information, it's paradoxical in that people now have more information going through them in a day than a person did in their entire lifetime 100 years ago. But the frequencies being so narrowed down to the objectives being driven by the few people controlling it, that people don't realize they're actually in what I would call a state of frequency starvation. So I just wondered about your thoughts on that concept. Um, what you were talking about, Paul, is that um, each part of our senses is connected to specific frequencies. And taste is also one of them. And sound is one of them. And also your, your, your eyes are part of that as well. And also your, your skin as well. You'll and smell. your organs, even your Oil. organs and Absolutely. glands. And uh, what we are doing now is that we are industrializing all those frequencies to products or certain um, material uh, products that, that you need at home. And then uh, we create immediately a limited number of frequencies around it. And our education system supports that as well. Yes, that's terrible. And uh, I think besides lesson number one, and we both agreed upon that one, be connected. I think lesson number two is that stay in nature. Yes. And and I think that it, it can it, it doesn't have to be like a lot of people that live in cities could be listening to this and going, well, how the hell do I get connected to nature? I live in downtown New York or Los Angeles or Chicago, et cetera, or Stockholm for that matter. But I find that just having plants and and paying attention to them, talking to them, and I ask my plants. I don't just water them at random. I I I wet my fingers and I touch the leaves, or I because I'm sensitive enough, I don't need to touch them. I just say, "Would you like some water?" And they always tell me when they want water. Are you getting enough light? You know. So by developing a relationship, even with a plant, and treating it as a living being, you can bring a little bit of nature into your home. And a great example I give people is, have you ever moved into a house and when you got in, you could feel that it was just empty. But once you put your plants and trees in there, the place felt alive. But when you take your plants and trees out, it feels just like a shell of material. And everybody I know says, yes, I feel that right away. So, you know, going to a local park, having plants, having pets, they all bring us into contact with other life forms which have different frequency spectrums that they express themselves in. And of course, they're different colors. And so I think that there's a lot of simple things that we can do to bring nature, even adding clay to water just to get some earth element for people in cities. I use clay for detoxification, but you can take some Montmillionite bentonite clay stir it into water and bring some real earth element into you. And I think for a lot of people in the city, that could be a very grounding uh, effect. Absolutely. And on top of that, I would like to add something, Paul, to this. Also, the way we set up architecture. Yes, absolutely. And uh, the way we build our houses nowadays, instead of using wood and normal natural products, we are going to move to artificial products. They don't have those vibrations. No. So uh, this definitely plays a role. Yes. And uh, having studied a lot of, of native cultures, one of the things in one of my books I found quite fascinating, I can't remember which Indian chief it was. It was an interview with one of the well-known Indian chiefs, but he talked about what happened when they took them and forced them into reservations. And he said, we always live in round teepees because the energy moves through them naturally but once we started living on reservations in square huts and square buildings we all started getting sick because we didn't feel we could connect to nature it was as though something was blocking our connection to the earth so i think and this is where ibrahim kareem's work in biogeometry is so powerful i think just going from a circular teepee that's cone shaped into a square box it, when you get people that are really tuned into the earth, they're sensitive enough to feel that that was a threat to their health. So I think you're right. We've got to really start realizing that shape is an antenna. And if we don't 
pay attention to the materials and the shape of the structure, we can end up bringing ourselves into a bath of frequencies that are incoherent with our biology and our psychology. Yep, absolutely true. I mean, uh, in modern nature, we see all kinds of antennas. Plants have that. The form of a plant, the form of a leaf, and also the way fruits and vegetables, how they look like, they're all kinds of antennas. And each antenna can collect a specific frequency, and that is what you eat as well. And we also limit down our quality of the food in a dramatic way, by the way. It's terrible. And then we also limit down the type of food. Yep. And the quality of the food. And the and the and the the master antenna of all, of course, is the DNA itself. Yep. And also the food responds exactly in the same way as, uh, as what you just described. Also food, and uh, when you just described how plants respond miles away, food is doing exactly the same. And that was for us uh, with, uh, with all the tests that we did with the biophotons was very important. We saw, for instance, that certain tomatoes growing in, in specific areas where you could control the growth of the plant. Uh, when you put them in soil that was uh, intoxicated with certain products and was under the control, and even the part of the DNA of the plant was in control, was manipulated, yeah. then we could see that the light form was limited and was very low. And uh, when you gave the plant a completely open soil structure with different types of water, especially what we call coherent water, then and suddenly we saw an explosion of energy and not only that, it was as if new creativity creativity was formed. The plant, the plant uh, took over control again. Beautiful. And that's the beauty. Now, feel free to answer in any way you want to this next question. Um, if you take everything we've just discussed and you throw this question, what happens when you get an mRNA vaccine that is now weaving itself into your own DNA and you have a synthetic generated vaccine, A, you are no longer human, and B, you cannot receive the same frequencies, and C, those frequencies are custom designed from my observation and research to interface with 5G systems. What's your thoughts in that regard? <laughs> It's an, uh, a very actual question, I think, Paul. <laughs> uh, let me say this. Um, a lot of the doctors in the world think that this is the, the new, great, fantastic uh, dream that they have, that they can cure any disease with this new type of technology. Uh, what we saw in our laboratory is that if you focus yourself only on one or two parts of a frequency, then you forget that you don't have an orchestra. Right. And it takes an orchestra to create life. And you won't have the few mu full music because your body is based upon that. And uh, certain rhythms even cannot be played on a specific if only a specific device. Sometimes you need an other part in the orchestra to come up with that frequency. Exactly. A bass drummer can never keep up with a piano player. That's it. That's it. And uh, I, I don't understand the incredible excitement of this. Well, it's part of the hypnosis. And uh, that is the way we think nowadays. And I think the whole research, and especially the scientific world, is uh, based upon that they get rewards and, and, and all kinds of bonuses if they move in a certain thinking form. But I start to wonder, do we really understand our fantastic body, which is one of the most amazing machines that has ever been developed? I mean, everything in this amazing body is, is working and it is, it is incredible. And it all works together with thousands of frequencies yes literally and what we do now is that we are bringing in one frequency to create one protein while we are maybe locking down 
thousands of others without knowing what the consequences are. But when I look to the current statistics, I see already a lot of side effects. Very much so. Very dangerous. And uh, I, uh, I am wondering, when do the side effects stop? <laughs> well, here's the problem. Once you have that stuff in you, nobody knows if you can ever get it out. I mean, it weaves itself into your DNA and it's self-replicating. So I think, I think this is the most dangerous experiment ever done on human beings. And if, uh, the, uh, the aim of it is total control and materialism. And the thing that makes my stomach sick is Klaus Schwab and all the people of the Great Reset say that this is to protect nature. But I'm saying, wait a minute, you're the comp- you own the corporations that are destroying nature. So, and this is all to control people's buying habits. So you can just keep stuffing money in your pockets. This, I, I've never seen such a well orchestrated lie in my life. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> I think you're not the only one. Uh, and uh, talking about 5G in that respect, uh, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, that that uh, that whole telecom issue that is coming up and is running all over the world already. Uh, not not in certain places like Africa, but in most places it is already uh, introduced and uh, it will evolve in the coming years. Um, there we have the same, especially also with, uh, you can also compare it a little bit with LED light. LED light also has limited frequencies. That in itself doesn't have to be a problem if you can use it well. But if you only use LED light, then you see only light with only one specific frequency. And what we are going to do now is that a lot of people forget that uh, 5G, they, they simply uh, from a legal standpoint of view, they say, yeah, well, when I put my mobile phone on my ear, then my head is not getting warmer than two or three degrees. No, it remains cool, so it can't hurt you. Well, they forgot that we are built up out of electromagnetic waves and frequencies. And the problem already with human mankind is that we have limited already our frequencies. And also the way we eat our food and we drink all kinds of stuff that is limiting down all the frequencies that we have to adopt. In. We have to get them in our body to become a real human being. So if we are going to increase all kinds of limited frequencies and we're going to increase um, RNA-based products, that only create one specific protein without looking to the rest of the body, then we are more or less uh, thinking in terms of how uh, the scientific world wants us to think. And I don't know if nature thinks the same way. As a matter of fact, I do know that nature thinks completely different. Nature wants us to think in all kinds of creative forms. Also with human beings, we need black people, yellow people, red people, white people, everything. All those forms are part of creation. And each brings something to the table. Yes. I tell people, what would it be like if you couldn't have access to Cuban music, to Mexican music, to to African music? I mean... All the great musicians of the world travel around the world learning how to play these other musics so that they enhance their creative abilities, like studying from different artists with different skills. What would it be like if there was no food except steak and potatoes? We'll call that the classic American meal versus Mexican food, Chinese food, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the whole thing would just be boring as hell, and we would either die from boredom or get creative and say we got to go somewhere else and find something different well it's very simple we 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 have seen several tests that we did also with fast food if people are eating fast food for more than two weeks the same food then you see that the whole microbiome into their intestine is already disturbed oh absolutely hi everybody I've looked into magnesium supplements in my many years as a therapist and found, unfortunately, most of them are junk until the day Wade Lightheart handed me his magnesium breakthrough from Bioptimizers. 
which is a very, very specialized product that they did a lot of research on. Wait, I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit about what makes Magnesium Breakthrough so unique and so potent. Well, number one is that we realized that different types of magnesium are absorbed by different parts of the body. So we tested virtually every magnesium product there was on the market, and it came down to seven different ones that produced the best aspects or best effects over the broadest amount of people. We combine them without any weird excipients or, you know, some of the chemical agents that other companies use. We don't use any of that stuff. And we combined it with humic and fulvic acid as well as B6 to make sure that it's absorbed and utilized by the body. That's excellent. I really love it because one of the things I love about all your products is I can actually turn people on to them. They buy them. And I've never had a single person say to me, those products don't work. Everybody that I know has continued to buy Bioptimizer's products to enhance their life. Where can people get it and what's their discount? Just go to www.magbreakthrough.com slash living40 and put in your coupon code Paul10 and you get a 10% discount. And of course, everything has a 100% money back guarantee. You can't get better than that. Enjoy. You mentioned when we started this little conversation right here that some doctors are thinking that this is what's going to happen and they think it's really good. And that triggered a memory of a comment David Bohm and Carl Jung both made, probably not even realizing they'd said it, each of them said it, but they almost said exactly the same thing. And I don't know if you've heard it before, but it's very relevant. Bohm said, Real thinking is hard work. That's why most people just rearrange their prejudices and call it thinking. Yeah. Well, and we are getting a lot of scientific prejudices by people who are very disconnected from nature and from life. And there's another saying it's very hard to change someone's belief system when their paycheck depends on it. And we are we're we are on the edge of destroying each other and the planet in the name of money. I agree. It's, it's, it's two things. It's scary as hell, but it's also very invigorating and inspiring because now the system, you know, Irvin Laszlo says the best time to change a system is when it's in a state of chaos because it's easy to change. So we're going into a state of chaos where we really have an opportunity to recreate these systems with safer technologies that interface with nature and ultimately allow us to use the science and the technology and the genius that we've put into all these destructive technologies in positive ways instead of spending money for example on advanced spy technologies that control us why don't we spend that on advanced systems to monitor the atmosphere and monitor the microorganisms in the soil and the pollution in the ocean and monitor large corporations, how much they're polluting, so that we can essentially do to the systems and technologies that we need to regulate for safety what they're trying to do to us for their own benefits. It seems like we have all the technology. We just got to use it in ways that are life affirmative instead of affirmative for a handful of billionaires. Yeah, well, it depends upon how do we look to the economy. Right. Yes, we have to really carefully consider what money is and what value is. I'll tell you one story. I was one in one of the biggest chemical uh, companies in the world. I was as a guest there, and I was uh, speaking with one of those uh, top uh, researchers. And they did research on homeopathy. And I was really surprised that he was very open to me. And he said, we did, over the last 10 years, we did multiple tests on homeopathy. I said, yes, and what was the outcome? He said, it works. He said, but. Mm -hmm. But for an economical reason, it is not the best product we can bring on the market. Of course. And that is uh, with all those things, that's part of the ballgame. Do we stick to an uh, economy that is going to destroy us and this entire planet? Or do we switch and do we get really smart and go back and uh, learn our lessons? But the fact is, we have to learn our lessons very fast. We do. Yes, we do. Um, 
I believe the founder of, of one of the pioneering researchers on homeopathy was a guy named Jacques Benavista. Are you familiar with? Yeah, the, Fr- the Frenchman. Yeah. Yes, they tried to ruin him for his research. Oh yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, they 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 were quite successful in that. Yes, but you know the the part because I read a book about all that and 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 also a couple of documentaries that I found over the years. But one of the things that cracked me up is I actually saw an interview with him and he was, you know, quite emotional and pissed off about this. And he said, the the scientific community kept saying that my research did not work. I did this research thousands of times in my library. He said, I got so pissed off, I hired a company to build a robot to run these experiments and ran them thousands of times perfectly under robotic control, and they still denied my research. But it's still the case all over the world. Yeah. And, uh, we have too many examples you know, in the research that we also did with pop and with uh, water, and we, we very often we get the same comment. And that is one of the reasons, for instance, that most of the tests that we have done over the last two or three years was always done by external universities. Because if if you're telling the audience that you did the test yourself, then you always get comments, yeah, but it is, you know, that is your own laboratory. So we said, we know that it is now stable. Now you test it. We've set up the protocol together, scientific protocol. Everybody can do it. You do the test and you tell us what is the outcome. Yes, but isn't it isn't it uh, a little odd that the FDA allows drug manufacturers to do their own tests? Absolutely. Now that's a a, a quote a version of science right there. Yeah, well, that is all based upon the, the rules of the economy, Paul. Yeah, but we have to really all of us have to rethink what the economy is. You know, what is money and what is value because it's gotten to the point now where nobody really knows what money is or where it is and, and how it works. <laughs> it's in the hands of just a few. That is what I know for sure. Yeah, me too. But, but, you, <laughs> but whenever you put things in the hands of just a few, you have the same problem of censorship and monocropping and farming and uh, color, colors going down to black and white, my way or the highway. And, and, you know, you and I both know that this, this is a formula for serious, serious problems and, and, and also disaster, which is why I bring these things up. And, and whenever I can get highly skilled, knowledgeable people like yourself, it's important that I talk about these things, because if I just talk about them, people think, oh, Paul's just a nut holistic hippie, you know. But I've had, you know, Irvin Laszlo, Walt Thornhill, top scientists, top thinkers, and everybody that understands the basic principles of science and nature all sees it clear as a bell. So it's really how do we wake the rest of the world up that's too busy eating uh, Count Chocula and playing video games because they're they're swinging the vote. Well, what you just do now, uh, Paul, is very important. You create a podcast. I mean, if we are going to become dependent and we are already too dependent upon the, the media and the television, then this message will never come through. So, uh, and I think a lot of people nowadays are really aware of the situation. And I would not be surprised that due to this whole vaccination and COVID situation, a lot of people will suddenly think what's going on here. Yes, I think that with enough death and injury, they're going to realize they've been tricked and they're going to get right pissed off. And I think that's when the healing is going to begin. And uh, well, then first the frustration starts and then the questions start and then all the excuses and all the, 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 the tricks, the whole tricks, the whole game, all everything was started. But a lot of people will start to rethink hey, what's going on here. And uh, maybe then the only solution uh, might be Mother Nature again. I think that's the alpha and the omega and if that is the case then uh, maybe this uh, situation might might be very helpful 
but I think we first have to go through some very interesting periods. Yes. And as scary as it is and as sad as it is, I think human beings are easily uh, held by the inertia of the status quo. So we need to shake the cage a little bit. And as much as I dislike Fauci, Gates, and everybody involved in all this, I'm grateful that they have poked the dragon just enough to wake it up. And from there, the show is on. Yeah. But we also have to understand that human mankind loves a kind of dependency. Yes, they do. That's the inertia I'm talking about. And uh, they, they would love to listen to certain, yeah, standards and that can be all kinds of forms that manipulate your brain and your mindset and if that mindset is too uh has to become a too big a part of your brain already how do you get out of that it, it creates a real blockage blockage at the end of the day so it must must be a serious shock to take that out yeah well i think i think uh we're on the edge of it um I'm curious, Dolph, how old are you? 66. 66. So I'm 60. What's it like for you having been on the planet for 66 years and thinking about what the future is going to be for the children of the world right now? Uh, I think it can go two ways. Or oh, we move to a fantastic new world. Or oh, we create a digital world based upon uh, a robotic robotic type of mankind that can be uh, controlled by multinationals and politicians and people think that this is nonsense well i have been in too many laboratories to see that this is no nonsense technically this is doable yes it is and uh, what i see already uh, on, 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 on a lot of young kids how they are addicted already and how they respond to talks like what we do I think, well, you and I, we have to do our homework and do it quick. And we have to tell them that the modern nature is offering much, much more than they, they probably think of. Yeah, they can't even conceive of it. You know, thank you for that segue. We, you know, there was a lot of water connection in there. But um, because you have such a deep knowledge of water, I want to mine your, your genius here. I personally feel that water is a perfect example of the complexity of nature that so beautifully weaves itself into simplicity. The water molecule, one hydrogen and two parts oxygen, is quite simple yet profoundly complex with regard to its functions in nature and both our being, our body, and our lives. In my studies of water over the span of my career, I've come across some amazing information about water through people like Rudolf Steiner, Victor Schauberger, and more recently, Gerald Pollack, and even great poets like Rumi, who often refer to water in ways that refer to it as divinity. Um, I'd love it if you can share an overview of what you've learned about water, what it actually does in nature, in our, in our bodies as human beings. And, you know, you've already touched on some, but it's uh, listening to your podcast with Tom Cowan, you talked about a wide variety of things. Are there things that you would like to share to bring into people's awareness about water that we haven't discussed yet, but are important to realize about water? Most people are not aware of the fact that water can absorb information. It is more or less a kind of a computer system. It can collect data. But when we think data, then we think that it must be the same data as what we find in a computer system. Oh, it is much more complex. And it collects data in such a way that it can communicate with certain quantum fields. Well, a lot of people think, what, what is a quantum field, et cetera, et cetera. But all those frequent, frequency fields are around us. And all those fields, they, they play with rhythms in nature, with the sun rising and going down, the moon, and, and, and how the scenes work. All of them are frequencies. And water response, yeah, you already mentioned the taste, respond to all those frequencies, but also it also responds to emotions. It responds to music. It responds to crystals. It responds to behavior. It responds to forms. So there is nothing so strange in this world as water. But 
what uh, make water so profound is that a lot of people forget that also in almost every religion in the world, water is playing a major role. Take, for instance, the whole uh, John the Baptist, yes? Mm -hmm. he, yes. He, he baptized Jesus into, into the River Jordan, yes? And uh, that was very important. We still baptize people in water. Why is that? Because we want to put that information into your system. And if water is going to be limited in absorbing the frequencies, then we are limiting down our own human mankind. And I think that is why it is so important that we have a much better understanding upon frequencies and what does a full spectrum means and what does a human body means. And uh, for us, uh, I give you one other example. I was, for instance, two years ago, I was invited by uh, Swami in, uh, in India uh, with some ministers there to, to join the Kumbh Mela. The Kumbh Mela is one of the biggest festivals in the world yeah. where about 100 million people come together. And they, uh, they are going to in the River Ganga in India on a specific date and a specific time. And uh, they do it for a reason. And again, you see that water is responding to the cycles of the sun and the moon and the other planets. And when you look to the water, it has an incredible impact. And all those things show that water is so important. But that is, again, let's go back to school and let's learn the kids how elements work. What is it? What is the soil doing? How all those micro biome into the soil, all the fungi, how does it work? How is it working together? But we only want to control and we want to keep control of it in our limited view. And I want to get rid of that. We have to understand Mother Nature. And then we are in an, I think, in a very uh, optimal frequency and an optimal rhythm that really can support our whole existence. And uh, that makes a difference. So uh, the reason that we went into water is very simple, Paul. We found out during all the tests that we did, and we did thousands of tests, like Jean Baptiste as well, but, um, that in almost every part of your body, in almost every chemical reaction, water is playing a role in your body. So if the water into your body is not in 100% of its power, then you can get all kinds of yeah, disorders. Mm -hmm. Every disorder can create something else as well. And we found out that if you are really able to create water that has the, the ability to give and take the full frequency, then immediately we noticed that with all the testing that we did, that you get a completely different energy, you get different light, you get full spectrum light, the waveforms are better, the taste is better, and Mother Nature respond to it. And then you have to learn your lesson that we hardly know how Mother Nature works. As a matter of fact, we know nothing. Yeah, that's the sad part. And I think we better start with it, and we have to do it soon. Yes. There are various competing theories as to where water on Earth came from, theories ranging from comets or asteroids that uh, hit the planet carrying water and populated the water on uh, brought the water to the earth to the earth generating water from the inside i believe in chinese medicine they asso associate metals in the earth with the production of water uh, also water arriving from space which current research shows to be almost everywhere uh, I, I saw a documentary recently where they showed that a scientist and astro astronomer took water and got the vibrational frequency, then tuned his telescope, you know, like an observatory style telescope to it. And then they showed that the water was everywhere in space. In fact, I think Greg Braden showed that on one of his shows and it showed pictures and it li literally looked like the whole of space was, was full of water. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on where water on the planet comes from and one of the reasons I'm asking that is because I've seen books 
suggesting that by the year 2030, water will be not only the cause of potential world wars, but will be far more expensive than gasoline. And it already is pretty much there if you go buy water. So I'm wondering what your thoughts in this regard are, because it, it can lend us to concepts about how can we regenerate water in healthy ways? Well, you uh, raised multiple questions, but let me first go to the first question. Where is it coming from? To be honest, I haven't. Um, what is really known nowadays, and you mentioned it yourself, is that most waters are in one way connected to the cosmos. The cosmos is full with it, how it looks like. We are not surprised at all about that as well, because what we do see is that water in one way or another is, is data. It's the communicator. It is the communicator through the entire cosmos. And uh, so for that respect, I think that if you talk about life itself, then in one way or another, you are connected to water. And the uh, multiple life forms that we have on this planet can only take place when you have all those waters. Um, first of all, there is in, in this planet, not one water is the same. Water in Japan is different than the water in Norway. It has to do with the minerals, and it has to do with also how the water is cleansed in that area, and it also has its own frequencies around it. So water is uh, different. What will happen in the year two, 2030 about uh, the, what we call the, the water wars? That has to do with the... Uh, incredible growth of the people all over the world and uh, we are lacking sweet water which is two percent of the world is only sweet water you mean drinkable drinkable water and uh, we have an incredible shortage of water uh, within a few years paul uh, 10 of the biggest cities in the world will lack drinking water that is what we know already now and uh, that also has to do with the complete environment that we work in, because in certain areas it doesn't rain enough anymore, and also the way we do agriculture. Right. That's the biggest waster of water and polluter of it. Yeah. And we have created uh, certain types of agriculture, especially the ones that manipulate it, and they, they take out a lot of water from the ground. I have been in areas in India whereby an incredible amount of farmers uh, committed suicide because they used seeds from outside. And those seeds were taking all the waters from the soil. Monsanto. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned the name. And uh, I've been there and it was terrible. It was really terrible. And uh, that is why you also need always local seeds that belong to a specific area. And if we want to create a normal world, we also have to bring back the normal seeds again that belong to a specific area. And uh, stop controlling them and manipulating them, but bring those seeds into the most optimal form in a natural way. And we can do that. For instance, we have seen that uh, if we are using our water, then the normal seeds that we have used, and then we talk about uh, seeds that have never been manipulated, organic seeds, we saw that uh, we could increase the light of those seeds every year 10 to 20 percent, year wow. after year. And I think uh, we have to go in that area. Yes, I think, too, from my research in farming, which has been extensive, and I was raised on a farm, and my father is the for many years the president of the farming association where i grew up um research into commercial farms shows that the percentage of humus in the soil is between uh 0 0.01 and one percent but in a normal environment farming environment it should be six percent of the soil and people like sir albert howard and lady eve balfour showed all the way back in the late 40s that one square foot of humus can hold eight pounds of water or a gallon of water. 
So the other thing is that stones are very important for regulating the flow of water. They act like sponges and slowly release the water into the environment. And then, of course, as we're killing the rainforest and deforesting and, and, and degreening the world, we're taking away all the protection from the sun and we're killing out all the root systems with all the uh, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, rodenticides that are all toxic. Po toxic. So then we're destroying the, mycel the mycorrhiza network that also helps carry water through nature. And, and there's another point that I wrote down. Are you familiar with Dr. Stephen Greer, the expert on uh, alien technologies and UFOs and things like that? Not, I've never met him. No, never. His work is amazing. His uh, series, he's got a series of documentaries that have been watched by billions of people called Close Encounters of the First Kind and the next one. Oh, I've, seen, I've seen that one. I've seen yeah. that one. Yeah. So his latest is Close Encounters with the Fifth Kind. It's very, very good. And he's probably the most knowledgeable man in the world and who has had the most contact with alien intelligences in the world. I'm bringing this up because in one of the, the uh, documentaries or shows, I think it was his series on Gaia called Disclosure with Dr. Stephen Greer, he mentioned specifically uh, having direct communication with alien intelligences that came to this earth and said they came specifically to investigate our water because the water on planet Earth is unlike the water anywhere else that they know of. So they're coming to take samples of our water and, and, and study it, which is, I thought, quite profound. Yeah, well, I cannot judge that. That is for me difficult to give an opinion on it. But I can tell you one thing about our, the water in the world. Uh, it really makes sense to, uh, to look through different types of water. I know, for instance, that uh, if water is stored, stored for a long period of time into clay then it has a completely different effect than other types of water so uh, the the minerals that we have on this planet play a major role in the quality of our water as well and we are in a very strange position on this planet because we have so many minerals uh, it is almost amazing how this uh, planet is organized. I mean, we have almost everything that you wish to, to, to make it happen over here. And all those elements, they have an effect upon the quality of our water. So uh, the effect, the, the, the reality is that our planet in itself is already amazing due to the fact that we have all those mineral structures and all those environmental issues here. Uh, so that I am not surprised that people are really looking to the quality of our water. Did you know that symbiotica means harmony? And you're really likely to enjoy my podcast with Sherveen Jaffariah, the founder of Symbiotica. Symbiotica is an amazing company that makes excellent products to aid healing, enhance longevity, and improve performance at all levels of your being, from your spiritual practices to your athletic endeavors. I highly recommend you go to Symbiotica.com and check out their top-notch organically sourced products that include excellent tasting supplements like their Synergy Vitamin B12, which elevates energy naturally, to their Sheila J Minerals, which help you better regulate your hormonal system. Their Biocharge Activated Coconut Charcoal is an excellent detox support and removes toxins and poisons from the body quickly and non-invasively. Their Organic Longevity Formula is one of my friends and students' favorites. They rave about it. I really enjoy their Regenesis Liposomal Glutathione for its amazing antioxidant powers, which is really helpful for anyone that enjoys vaporizing tobacco and herbs like I do. They also have great immune support products, water filtration options for drinking and showering, and some cool clothing and more. When you go to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A dot com and use your Living 4D discount code, which is capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15 on checkout, you get 15% off anything they sell and you won't be disappointed. Enjoy Symbiotica. Are you familiar with diamagnetic versus paramagnetic energies? No. Okay, well... Uh, the guy that was the real researcher on this was a scientist named Dr. Philip Callahan. He's got a book called Paramagnetism. I think you'd find it fascinating. But what he did was he traveled the world to all the famous healing sites and places where there was 
known to be like the Nile, uh, where they where they were in biblical days and all the reports of lush uh, farming and vegetation. And he measured the amount of paramagnetic energy. So paramagnetic energy has an affinity to the south pole of a magnet, but water and typical body tissue and most material substances are diamagnetic. So they're oriented toward the south pole of a magnet. And so he, he shows this very scientifically. And he also was the first one to prove scientifically that the sun does something that scientists never thought was possible. And it creates monopole photons, some of which during solar flares are paramagnetic and it splits them. Normally they're balanced para and diamagnetic like yin and yang balanced. But he showed that during solar flare activities, the sun releases huge surges of paramagnetic photons, which are absorbed into the earth. And so what this means and what he showed, which was very relevant to farming, and, and I'll tell you why it's relevant to water, just like a battery, say your car has a 12 volt battery, there has to be a polarity differential. That's why you have a positive and negative pole. And if it runs low on acid, then the polarity differential neutralizes and it won't start your car. It runs out of energy. So he specifically highlighted, and I have a whole book on all the minerals that are paramagnetically charged. And he showed by studying the pyramids and all the stones at places like Ayers Rock, Stonehenge, he showed they were all specifically selected because they were made of minerals that were highly paramagnetic. And he shows pictures in one of his books, it might be Tuning Into Nature is the title of the book, but he shows how he could take a paramagnetic substance and he went into the king's chamber in one of the pyramids and actually shows this paramagnetic material hovering float levitating right on top of the stone because the stones were so highly paramagnetic that a paramagnetic substance acts like a south pole on a south pole magnet and they repel each other and you couple that with breathing exercises he showed that oxygen is the most highly paramagnetic substance known in nature which on his scale was rated at 10,000 so every time we breathe, we bring in a charge of paramagnetic energy, which creates a polarity differential with the diamagnetic water in our bodies, which becomes life force energy or chi. But he showed that in commercial farming, they selectively demineralize the soils and he measured the paramagnetic energy and showed that on commercial farms, it was almost non-existence. But in places like the Nile Basin, the paramagnetic charge was 600. He said any good farming soil has to have between 150 or, and 300 as a paramagnetic rating or the polarity differential won't grow the plants because the plants grow along the electrical field. They literally follow the electrical field. That's why they know where the sun is. They're following the electrical field. The magnetic field, as you know, wraps itself around the earth. So the point I'm driving at with all of this is that once we start demineralizing the soils, we decrease the charge coupling that infuses water with natural energy that then becomes the energy that gives the plant the growth potential. If we stop breathing properly, then we decouple ourselves and we become flat and start drinking too much coffee, tea, and eating sugar to compensate. But when water is down in the earth being processed, it's going through these mineral formations that have a balance of paramagnetic and diamagnetic energies, and they're charging the water up naturally. But when we have as much of the earth covered by commercial farms and chemicals, and you got Bill Gates, who owns 240,000 acres of farmland and is actually trying to collect all the seeds from the world so people can only get seeds from him, we have a very, very dangerous situation. And if we don't get the mineral balance back in the soil and clean the toxins, we could end up covering this planet with all the rain can hit the ground and never be revitalized. Yeah, there is, uh, this is a very important uh, item that you bring up. First of all, if you, I've been in uh, many uh, pyramids all over the world, and by all of them, there is a river in the neighborhood all of them. And uh, if you measure the water in that area, then the water is absolutely different. So uh, there is a certain uh, 
energy in that water that has a uh, different level than most other waters in the world, that's for sure. Uh, by the way, you also have some rivers in the world that have the same. Water coming from the Himalayas has a different meaning. It has a different power as well. What is happening now as well is that you talk about the plus and the minus and uh, what affected that, because you need the plus and the minus if you want to create energy. Uh, one of the things that we have found out is that if you are working also with things like 5G, uh, first of all, you have to understand that uh, any electromagnetic field is absorbed by water. And that has an effect upon also what you call the paramagnetic field into the water itself. And not only that, what we have seen in our laboratory is that water is looking to the communication. But when you have, have had contact with 5G, then a part of the communication is completely gone. And it can hardly restore itself. So the whole communication with water, with the environment, that what I told you uh, a few minutes ago, is that water plays a role in every biological system into your body. If the communication is gone, then, well, I, you can predict yourself what is going to happen. Chaos. So, absolutely. And that is what we call it. We call that chaos. And that's the difference. Are we going towards a world in our water that what we call coherent, that it can communicate? Or are we going to create chaos? And uh, the more 5G, especially when we are going to uh, bring 40,000 satellites next year, into the air, uh, I can tell you one thing. If we are going to beam that energy through the clouds and to the rivers and to the lakes, we're going to pay a price. Well, we already are. You know, I, I mentioned up further in our, our outline, are you familiar with The Invisible Rainbow by Arthur Furstenberg? No. Oh, my God, Dolph, that book's going to blow your mind. I'll write it down immediately. Yeah, The Invisible Rainbow by Arthur Thurston, F-I-R-S-T-E-N-B-E-R-G. That's the most comprehensive document probably in the world on the research of what happens to the environment, to nature as a whole, and to human beings when you expose them to electrical devices. And it goes all the way back to the very beginning with Marconi, the telegraph wires, I won't summarize the whole book now, but it is mind blowing. And he shows very clearly that radar systems and radio systems and television systems all are causing serious problems in nature, killing trees, killing the fungal network. Um, it causes huge amounts of disease. And he shows something rather shocking. He shows that every time there has been a breakout of influenza on this planet. It happened directly after they built a new super-powered radar or radio system and up the, the um, amplification power. And this has been going on since the 1700s, and he tracks it all and shows it's exactly these breakouts occur all over the world. And many doctors have tried to figure out how it is that a virus can spread itself around the world instantaneously. And the only linking connection is radio waves, microwaves, radar, all these systems, because they communicate non-locally. So they're, they're not in one place at one time. They're everywhere. And just to give you an example, all the way back in the beginning of the telegraph era, when I think he said the, the line, the power of the current running through the lines, it was DC power. I think it was like 80 volts. It wasn't a lot. It was a small, it might've been 30 volts, somewhere between 30 and 80 volts. Some professor had this curious question. How far from one of those telegraph lines can you measure an electrical shift in the earth? He found you could get 200 miles away and the telegraph operator could hit the key and he could put his electrodes in the soil of the earth and pick up the exact shift in the frequencies through the earth. And later scientists redid it and found that you can go to the other side of the world and pick up in the earth, even a telegraph signal on the other side of the planet, showing that the earth is a 
wildly sensitive electromagnetic conductor and that everything we're doing is affecting every part of the globe 24 7. True. Uh, the Earth is really a conductor. And uh, what is going and what is happening at the moment is that also our minds also create a kind of electromagnetic field. And uh, what you do see on this Earth, we did this test ourselves multiple times, by the way. Uh, we look to certain areas whereby we do notice that uh, in, in a specific spot, there was more than a normal electromagnetic field available, a kind of line or electrical field there. That field can communicate, and that communicates, can communicate all over the world. And if you are going to uh, bring toxin, toxins on those fields, then you really have a problem. So what you just described is, uh, is really, uh, it's an issue. But I can tell you one thing in the, standard scientific world this is nonsense yes of course <laughs> because it gets in the way of profits <laughs> that's it yeah it's funny how money has this effect of completely narrowing a person's consciousness till they can't see anything except what they want to see for their own profit even when it's killing them and their family. It's like, wow, what a disease. I, it really brings forth the ancient saying, money is the root of all evil. You know, it, it, can, be, it can be good, but boy, as the old saying goes, absolute uh, power brings absolute corruption. Um, are you familiar with the Aboriginal concept of the Aboriginal song lines? There's an amazing book called Voices of the First Day by Robert Lawler, which is a really beautiful uh, investigation into the whole Aboriginal culture on many levels, but I've seen research showing that they were actually using ley lines and they, they could actually transmit messages hundreds and hundreds of miles. But here's an example of human technology. They use their own mind to send messages and they could say, meet me at such and such a place, which they might have to walk days to get to. And sure enough, the other tribesmen knew exactly when they would be there. They got the messages. So if we look back to cultures like the aboriginals who could do long distance communications with clear comprehension using nothing but the energy of the earth and their own consciousness, I'd say we should invest in that technology and bring people up, which requires clean water, clean earth, understand the electromagnetic grid of the earth and using it intelligently because then we could all evolve ourselves and we could protect the planet and we would be using the most advanced technology that the universe has given us called ourselves and nature. Yeah. I, uh, again, Paul, I think we have to go back to school. We do. And we, we paradoxically have to go back to school with the same people, the very scientists that poo poo this stuff. Yeah also think all these ancient cultures were just stupid people living in caves and toiling with rocks and sticks. I mean, I, I tell people that have that idea, I say, okay, I have a question for you. How do you get pyramids with hundred ton blocks of stone with one to three thousandths of an inch precision? And even though we can build uh, spacecraft and get to the moon, we cannot build a pyramid and if you believe what they say in universities, that it was natives rolling those blocks of stone up wooden rollers, you're an idiot because I work with stones almost every day and a rock that big would crush a wooden roller. So we have to go back and start really taking a lot more stock of the technology that was left for us because a lot of it's still there. We just got to think about what was really going on, such as great documentaries on Gaia and the series called Ancient Civilization showing how they ran power through the pyramids using large stone steeples which were packed with crystals in the middle of pools of water and created that polarity differential and they even found copper tubes running from these water sources through the entire pyramid showing they were powering the entire system off of stone, crystals, water, and a brass plate. So it's not a question if we have the technology, it's a question of whether or not we're going to be disciplined enough to say, okay, we've got to get rid of these 
monsters that are controlling everything and keeping us in the dark ages instead of telling us that the people that were the smartest on the planet were the ones in the dark ages. Yeah, well, uh, the good news is that we have a great adventure in front of us because all those things have to uh, to uh, come up. And uh, I think that this is really playing a role. I mean, if you have ever been in a pyramid, you understand that this is almost impossible to make. Uh, I mean, you cannot even see a difference of one millimeter between the stones. I mean, that means it, it's even... You cannot even put a razor blade between them. I mean, <laughs> it's it's incredible. One of the questions I wanted to ask you, just particularly for the listeners, is: Can you give us an overview of the difference between dead water and living water? We'll start right there. I've got three questions in a row, so uh, go ahead. Raise all the questions at once, and then I can maybe. Okay, so what is the difference between dead water and living water? What does it mean when the term coherent water is used? And can you explain Gerald Pollock's fourth phase of water so the listeners understand what that means when you hear the term the fourth phase of water? So living and dead, coherent, uncoherent, fourth phase. Okay, good. Uh, let, me, uh, let me try to give you the answer on all of those uh, questions. Great. What is dead water? Um, well, people use the term dead water in, in different forms. Some even use it already if, they, if you demineralize water. So if you take out all the minerals, what you most of the time do in a laboratory, uh, then you really have only H2O. But real water, what we need to drink, is also full with minerals. It has an effect. And that is very important. Water is coming much more alive when it is coming out of a well in a mountain and it is making left and right turns. You see vortexes, left and right and left and right. And that water is getting much, much more energy anytime. So what do we mean with death and living water? What we mean with living water is that it has more energy. It has the ability to communicate. And what is coherent in this phase, that in a coherent state, it has a kind of a structure in itself. And uh, let's say that it has a type of crystalline structure. It is not one crystal and it is never stable, but it has a kind of intelligence in itself that it knows how it can attract information, data from outside. and then it can communicate with that. So something in that water knows how to communicate with the outside world, can absorb that information and can bring it to any biological system. Then water is really alive and then it has a certain state of coherence. When it is not coherent, then you can create chaotic water. Then it doesn't mean that there is, it can still have minerals in it, but it cannot create a crystalline form that can communicate with a big field around it. So it cannot absorb all the data. What Gerald Pollack did, and he did a fantastic job, he, he can show you that he can split the water in a plus and a minus. And that is what he is calling the fourth phase of water. He said, because water has the ability to do that, and that makes that we have clouds. That makes that our body can work because all that information is into the water, but it can split it up into areas. He can create a battery out of it. And that is what Gerald Pollack is calling the fourth phase of water. We don't talk about the fourth phase of water. We talk about water as the communicator in a full spectrum way, in a coherent state, so that it can absorb the outside information and bring that to a cell. Yes, so there is a, but what Gerald Pollack did is really fantastic and he can show in, uh, in a scientific way that he can split up the water, that you get really a kind of left and right turning water or a plus and a minus, that's more correct what I say now. So, and he also and, talks about too how 
it our body does it along capillary structures, arteries, veins, lymph vessels, heart. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Everything, a heart is, is telling us a heart can never pump all the blood. It's impossible, he said. Yeah, Steiner talked about that in the 1800s. He said the heart is not a pump. No, yeah, it pumps, but <laughs> it does much more. And only due to the fact that our, our, our water into the body has the ability to split to split in a plus and a minus, then it creates a kind of energy, and then everything is working. So uh, what Gerald Pollard did is really fantastic. Uh, but uh, very unfortunate for him, uh, his, his work is only known by a limited number of scientists, and, and they really love his work, and he deserves that, because I think what he did is fantastic. But water can, water can do much more. Yes. And, and, uh, you know, I've studied all of Victor Schauberger's books and, you know, as you know, I'm sure, you know, Schauberger, right? Oh, absolutely. He's one of your, he's from your neighborhood up there in the Scandinavia. In Austria. Yeah. In yeah. Austria. Yeah. So, you know, he, he talked about the necessary curvatures water has to go through and showed all of his plumes that he made for moving logs, which was a question I wanted to ask you while I'm on that, but, uh, Two things. One, Schauberger's technologies have been used all over the world because there's companies that make water systems based on him and Steiner's technologies. But one of the things I've read a lot of interviews with people, for example, I saw one with a company that makes cakes. They're a a baking company. And they talked all about how once they switched over to Schauberger's water system, that the bread rose better, it tasted better, that all the processes in the whole uh, mixing and baking processes were greatly enhanced. It seems, you know, Steiner's technology, he talked, he, in, in biodynamic farming, the farmer sings when he's making the biodynamic preparation, he sings to the barrel as he's stirring it. And, and I do that when I make ayahuasca tea, I sing to it for days as I'm making it and harmonize it with my love and my intentions. Um, But one of the things Schauberger said, which I wanted to ask you about, he said that water did not like sunlight and that the water was at its peak capacity for work when it was around, I think, 40 or 42 degrees, which he evaluated because he said when the water got warm, he couldn't carry big logs down these plumes. But when it was cold and he found if it was kept in a cold, dark space, that it was stronger. So I'm just curious, from your perspective, what what do you think he was really identifying there? Okay, what uh, water does on certain temperatures, especially when it is very cold, uh, when you have three, four degrees water, you have completely different water than when it moves up to 40 degrees. Uh, The atoms move different, but also the effect is different. What What he refers to is the physical effect of water. Uh, but he never researched the biological effects. And he did some research on biological systems as well, because he gave some of this water to uh, to some people in his country and to Germany. And some of them, they really cured. Uh, but he found out that his water couldn't remain stable for longer than two, three weeks. And that means that the coherent state is temporary. And uh, that is what uh, we notice as well. Most waters that uh, have left or right turning vortexes or crystalline forms, when you use that water, it remains stable only for a minute, an hour, two hours, maybe a day, and that's it. That is why we always used in our laboratory when we were looking to water, we always uh, contact made contact with electromagnetic waves because that destroys water immediately. And then I mean the most telco waves, the normal electromagnetic waves like the sun and the moon is different. So what he was talking about, water doesn't like sun, is related to some of the physical effects that he wanted to create in water. But the water that we have used, for instance, and that we have made in the coherent state loves the information because we see that the sun is giving data and it can absorb the data and when it can hold that data 
And it has a huge effect upon the body. So we are talking about two different things. Yes, very interesting. Now, I'd love it if you can share what your analemma uh, water structuring device, do you refer to it as a pen or what do you call it? Well, some call it a wand, uh, a wand and other will call it a pen. I don't, I don't mind. Or some call it a stake. Or... Wand, wand is really more appropriate when you look at the symbology of a wand. So I'll call it the wand. So when you're using your uh, analemma wand, um, could you tell us how it works um, and why people should consider it and also how it works for anti-aging? Because I noticed you, uh, I think there was a conversation, a uh, section of the conversation with Tom Cowan, but I, I understand the concept, but I, I think I, I, because I really feel that that technology you've created is like we talk about a lot of people in cities are they, they don't have it as easy as people like us that, that you know go live in the country or make ourselves more connected to nature so really what i'd like like to hear from you is what does the analemma wand bring people that don't have access to real quality water artesian water like i do or you might and how can that tool uh, benefit them from health reason for health reasons uh, this is an important question, and uh, I, will, uh, I will definitely answer this. Water all over the world is under uh, pressure. No matter where it's coming from, we did tests on water in the Himalayas, the Rocky Mountains, Greenland, uh, from icebergs, from, from all kinds of areas, Rocky Mountains. And uh, what we test is that most waters in the world, in one way or another, have lost a kind of coherent state that can absorb the full spectrum. Yes, it can absorb a certain state, and yes, it can respond. Due to the fact that we introduce a lot of toxins in the world, and nowadays also electromagnetic fields, and the way we do agriculture in the world, because a lot of the rainwater is getting onto the land, the land is quite often full with toxins, and then you get groundwater, the groundwater gets back to the river. So our cycle of the water and the communication is getting into problem. Most people think that if you if you cleanse the water in a chemical way, then it is water again. What we what we found out is that that is absolutely not the case, because then it still remains in its structure chaotic. So then it is still not able to get the full spectrum again. Yes, it is absolutely better if you cleanse it if when you have polluted water, but it is never, ever the 100%. What is the want doing? Uh, in the want, you have what we call modern water. That is water that has been made in a natural way, no electricity, no, no, nothing, no magnets, nothing. It was purely based upon how but a nature works, we were able to listen to certain laws of nature and we brought it back into water and that water remains stable. Even after years, we have tested that. And that water has again the full moon cycle and the sun cycle in it again. If you put such a wand into a glass and you put it into a glass for let's say 30, 40 seconds and you swirl it around, then after 30, 40 seconds, the glass is be also becoming more coherent again. And then it can absorb again that full power from the outside world, positive world. And not only that, it also gives a protection against some of the radiation from 4 and 5G as well. Oh, that's fantastic. That is how we tested it. That was for us very, very critical. And uh, what we have seen, and then we tested it on, I don't know um, on how many farms in the world, but also on humans and on animals. And one of the tests that you just mentioned is that, yes, we did a test in London, and we gave it to people that want for three months, and they had to drink two, three glasses of water a day. And that's what they did for two, three months. And before and after the test, urine and blood me measurements were taken of those people. And surprise, surprise, all of them 
and a different Kleigen age effect into the body. And what does it mean? That the aging process went down dramatically, dram dramatically even by some people. Uh, people who were four, 50, 60 years old, their average age, biological age, went down with 12 years. Wow. And those tests uh, all were done by an external organization because we don't have the equipment. It's done by official organizations. Right. Hi, everybody. Do you guys want to know one of my secret weapons that helps me avoid being sick or feeling run down? It's Organifi Immunity. Organifi Immunity is a super high quality certified organic drink mix that provides daily immune support and supports overall immunity. Organifi Immunity contains whole food vitamins C and D, whole food zinc, mushroom beta-glycans, and provides only natural sweetness. Not only will you support your immune system, but you'll also get on-the-go superfoods in a delicious orange blend that is great for you and your kids and everyone will love it. My family and I love it and it's easy as tearing off the top of the package and mixing it with high-quality drinking water and you can rest a little easier knowing that you're enhancing your immune system, which is probably a good idea now that so many people are spending so much time indoors, breathing indoor air, and lacking sun exposure. Why not enjoy a little immune insurance while getting certified organic nutrients, superfoods, and great taste that's quick easy, and effective. To get your Organifi Immunity and shop their amazing product line with your Living 4D discount, go to organifi.com and save 20% on any and all of their products using the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20. That's check 20 during checkout. Enjoy Organifi. Are you familiar with the term mother liquor from the water that comes in salt when it's mined from the earth? No. no. Okay. Uh, as a water researcher, I'm going to give you an interesting tip that might find very interesting for research. If you buy uh, like a bulk amount of say Celtic sea salt, I've had, I've bought, um, especially the bigger crystals, you know, not the fine ground crystals, but the, the bigger ones that are like little cubes. You can actually see the cubicle structure of the salt. So maybe, uh, you know, an eighth of an inch each side of the cube. If you open the packages, they're often wet inside. And in my studies of salt, I found experts talking about the mother liquor, which is the ocean water from millions of years ago trapped inside the salt formations and they talk about how there's typically in a in, in in salt there's about 40 roughly 40 to 42 um minerals and trace minerals but there's also additionally another 40 plus micro elements like micronutrients from the ocean itself that's trapped into the salt which is very helpful nutrition for the body and as you surely know, um, minerals are key hormone regulators in the body. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because it would really be interesting for you to use your technology, especially looking at photon exchange structure, to get a hold of some high quality sea salt that still has that mother liquor in it. And if you could carefully extract it and test that, because I think there might be some secrets hiding in there for you. Yep. Well, I'm looking forward to it. I uh, definitely will uh, will have a look on this. Yeah, the term is mother liquor. That's the name of the uh, water, ancient water trapped in these salt formations. Um, I think I learned about that. There's a audio program available through the Celtic sea salt people. If I can find that audio, I'll, I'll email it to you. But uh, but I know for sure it's there because I've actually open packages of salt and thought there this must be the mother liquor because this is wet and they didn't send it they didn't they don't water salt otherwise it would dissolve yeah you, can, yeah you can tell it's inside the crystals um the other thing is that we haven't talked about <laughs> i'm sure you'll have something to say on this we have some serious friggin' problems with the military doing a lot of very dangerous shit with high frequency 
scanning devices, radar under the water in the ocean. And people don't talk about this. And this has been tracked right back to whales and dolphins beaching themselves because these systems like, uh, what is it, the HARP system and a few others, they're filling the ocean as full of these technologies for tracking submarines and things like that. I mean, we're really fucking poking the dragon here. Uh, well, my comments on this, uh, Paul, is uh, the following. Uh, every device, like a radar system, uh, when it is going to beam for a long period into water, uh, is going to store that information into water as well. And it creates a chaotic system. So, uh, and it doesn't mean that uh, only the U.S. is working with this technology. I mean... Uh, Many countries do the same, and uh, I think it's is uh, yeah it's it's the world we live in at the moment. But uh, we have to be realistic. It has an effect. Yes, uh, and it's getting dangerous. And Arthur Furstenberg really <laughs> slays the dragon. I you can get his book on audio audio book Audible. I know it's a it's a it's a big book, probably 700 pages, but it's a fantastic listen and it's very well done. I would really appreciate it when you get through that book if you send me an email and give me your thoughts. Yeah, but Paul, then we talk about uh, certain radio systems. But what do you think if we are going to bring in 40 to 50 thousand satellites into the air? Well, we already have about. Uh, 40,000 existing, and and Arthur Furstenberg says they're planning on launching at least another 42,000 more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're going to turn the earth into the equivalent of a bell that is being rung with such intensity it could shatter. Yeah. So um, Nikola Tesla also had to stop some of his tests because he knew that he could damage a lot of the world. Uh, but what we are doing is, uh, is, is in my way, is a way, uh, uh, is, is, uh, we move into an area that uh, definitely uh, needs a rethinking. Yes, seriously. Well, that's why I, I devote so much of my podcast to talking about these issues, because sadly, <sighs> I hate to say it, but there's a reason they call a PhD piled higher and deeper. My my friend, uh, um, one of my friends, uh, James Wanless, who is a PhD, calls a PhD progressive head death. But the point I'm making is that our education systems are not educating us in how to live in harmony with the earth. And as Bruce Lipton says, Prior to Francis Bacon, the definition of science was to find ways to work in harmony with nature, but Bacon changed the definition of science to find to use science to control and dominate nature. And I think if you look at how science began behaving around the time of Francis Bacon's shift of concept, you see that we went away from being more harmonious with nature and living better to using science as a weapon and kerning nature uh, from a living organism that we are products of into something that's material that's just for our own uses that we can control. So I think it, a lot of this boils down to rehabilitating the education system and getting science to be holistic and moral again, because we've reached the point where science is now one of the most dangerous threats to our very existence. Yeah, and I think we, uh, we have a limited time frame very much so. And I hope that a lot of people are starting to understand that uh, this is going to be a topic. And uh, what we just discussed, maybe due, due to the whole corona situation in the world, uh, we will have a change in the coming years. And, and uh, one of the things that we have to understand, Paul, is that a lot of people do understand, for instance, uh, they talk about 2030 yeah, and the, the Great Reset, but what they talk about is that we move to a technocratic world. And I think that uh, <laughs> it is just the opposite. That's what the Hopi prophecy shows. Are you familiar with the Hopi prophecy? Yes, I am. 
So you know the drawing on the rock, it gets to a fork. If we keep following the road we're on, it comes to a dead end. But if we go back to the earth, it goes all the way around the rock. And I'm like, ladies and gentlemen, get your nose out of your iPhone and get a real education because most people, I, I did a, a video on YouTube called Why Kings Kill Your Children. And I show exactly how our whole education system has been railroaded by the large tech corporations to train us from the very beginning to be codependent upon these technologies that are profitable to them and they're destroying the planet and our children. Well, due to Corona in the Western world, everybody has to work now with a computer system. Right, which is problematic. Problematic. And uh, they hardly can get out. As a matter of fact, they cannot even touch another human being. <laughs> yeah. If they believe in it. <laughs> if they believe in it. Uh, so now we are, we are moving very fast in a direction whereby we can really uh, can, uh, can get into a time frame that uh, can, uh, can create big, big problems. And that is why I, but I'm still optimistic by it, uh, Paul, uh, because uh, people like you and many others all over the world are uh, really rethinking about the whole situation in the world. And that's, uh, of course, uh, the, in the media, everybody is talking about the Great Reset. Uh, but I see a lot of people also raising questions about that. Yes, and it's good. You know, for me, I believe as souls, we all come to the place and time we do to learn what we came to learn, but to share our genius with others and co-create and evolve together. So as crazy as it is, I, I look at this as the reason I'm here and the reason my whole life has been oriented around holistic knowledge and I devoted my life to it because I see this as, as really like an initiation into our adult responsibilities to take care of the planet and to focus on what's really important physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, and to put money into perspective. And so I think we're really going through probably the most dangerous yet the most exciting time because right now there's every reason for the child geniuses and the geniuses at all levels to come out of the woodwork and come up with beautiful solutions. And an example that really inspired me, I don't know if you saw this, but this was actually, uh, I, think it was, I think it was Europe, maybe New York, but I recently saw that kids, teenagers, who were aware that they're being spied on by their phones and didn't like it, figured out how to trick the facial recognition software by wearing certain colors of makeup and putting their hairstyles so that it covered one eye and they knew exactly where the data points were being drawn from. So they came up with all sorts of cool ways to do their faces and their hair so that the phones can't track them. And I said, no, that's the emergence of the genius I'm looking for right there. I, uh, yeah, that's, that is absolutely uh, playing a role. And I'm very pleased that uh, those kids are standing up now. I hope that not all of them will be vaccinated. You hope they won't be vaccinated? No, I mean, if all of them will be vaccinated, I haven't got a clue what it means for them. I, I missed you there. You know, if all those kids, those fantastic, beautiful kids get, get vaccinated, uh, then I'm wondering uh, what side effect that is going to give to them. So I hope, I hope that uh, we have enough kids that stand up yes well i've seen some great reports of whole classrooms walking out in fact just the other day um one of my, my senior instructor matt walden who's editing my new book was talking to me and he said on the very day it happened he said today uh, or or just the other day he said my daughter who she's a teenager i think she's probably 14 was in school and he got a text message, dad, they're here trying to vaccinate us. What should I do? And she said to him that the star uh, football player, soccer player of the school was in her classroom 
And he stood up in front of the whole class and said, this is bogus science. These have not been properly researched, and I do not want to be used as a guinea pig. I don't know about you, but I'm not letting them vaccinate me. And the, all the kids listened to him, and they walked out together. They refused to. So I think it only takes a, a few strong, wise ones to pull the other ones into formation. There's a point I wanted to make uh, before I forget. Are you familiar with the biomeridian systems that nutritionists and healthcare professionals use to use electrical analysis on body systems? Yep. Well, my wife, Angie, she's a, she's a, a licensed nutritionist. And um, years ago, when her and I first got together about 10 years ago, I'd been drinking my water from my water charger since 2006. And that's all I drink unless I absolutely can't get to it because I'm traveling or something. But she tested me and she just wanted to see what what my body looked like when she tested and one of the things they do is measure the phase angle of the cell and and that tells you the permeability of the cell and how well hydrated the cell is and the numbers then are correlated to your biological age based on your phase angle because of the water's reaction to the electricity in your body I think mine was 9.8, but anyhow, the chart said that I was between eight and 10 years old. <laughs> and she, she was blown away. She said she'd never seen that in anybody. I said, I can tell you exactly why that is. That's the water I drink. So have you ever done tests like that with the Alta uh, and Alemo? No, to look, look at I, look, I, I would look forward to work with her and see how other people respond to the one. Yeah, well, if you guys get me one, I'll have her test it. <laughs> you get one. Right on, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my my wife, she's sharp, man. She's She's got, uh, both of them are. Uh, Angie's got a degree in biology, a degree in, a degree in energy medicine, a degree in nutrition. She's an advanced trained shaman who did three years of training with Michael Harner at the Institute for Shamanic Studies. And she's a, a and she's about to finish her training to be an instructor in biogeometry for Ibrahim Karim. And our whole property is done in biogeometry. Well, she is very much aligned with your thinking, I believe. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> Penny, Penny's no slouch either. Penny has a master's in biological anthropology from Cambridge, a master's in business administration from Colorado State, a master's in exercise and sports science, and she's a pilot. Wow. <laughs> Two fantastic ladies. And I got a ninth grade education. <laughs> so the, 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 the two girls take my wild brain and they organize it so everybody else can take advantage of it. But the point, the reason I brought the water phase angle, because I thought, you know, uh, it just goes to show you that structured water can really have an effect on the physiology of your cells and your overall health and your capacity for detoxification. So if, you know, with the analemma doing that for people, I think it's just a miracle that you can, I mean, you're basically able to do with your wand what I'm doing with a, a, a technology that I had to spend $10,000 for all the stones to build it. Now it's a big one. I can build them cheaper, but it's a lot of work and you have to have a yard to put it in. And you, so there's a lot of technology. Uh, I mean, a lot of requirements to have one. Not everybody can build a water charger, but everybody can have one of your analemma wands, which I think is just Absolutely. so necessary today. Uh, you can take it with you in your bag and you can carry it with you when you travel. And that is what we do. And uh, it is so easy to use. I mean, you don't need any education. You simply have to put it in a glass of water and that's it. And the effects are really remarkable. Yes. And one of the things that blew my mind, which I really think people need to hear, is you guys did a lot of research to engineer that water so that it can even withstand x-rays at the and uh, all the scanning and airports and all that stuff. And it won't lose its coherence, which that's a, a feat of engineering right there. Yeah. Well, the engineering, to be honest, Paul, was done by Mother Nature. Yes. So you are a great student then. That's it. And uh, we, we had to go through uh, some very interesting lessons and to find out how do you keep it that way. Of course, we, we, we have some technology to support that, but uh, that technology were, was uh, and is used without any form of electricity, nothing like that, no, no specific minerals, nothing. 
So we had to go through a very serious learning curve. Uh, but this was for us the final test. Can it remain stable? And for how long? Well, it keeps uh, the stability, as far as we know now, for years and years. That's fantastic. And and uh, that that's not that big of an investment at all. It's one, what is it, 170 or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you compare it with what it can do for your health, it is really amazing. I mean, people spend that much in two weeks at Starbucks on coffee and shit, right? Yeah, and absolutely. video games. So it's it's a, a really amazing technology, which is why I was really excited to talk to you about it. Uh, one of the books I've studied is Blueprint for Immortality by Harold Saxon Burr, which I think was published in like 40, somewhere between 47 and 49, 1947, 49. He was a professor, a professor at Yale University and conducted experiments that demonstrated water's capacity to carry psychic energy and information. He took seeds of the same genus and source and potted them and then broke them into two groups. He then had students in his class hold on to a glass mason jar with, of water, each of them, for about three to four hours which was group A, he also took mason jars of water to a psych ward in a hospital where people were under lock and key because of psychological illness, and he got them to hold on or interact with mason jars of water. And then he watered group A uh, plants, seeds, with the water that his students had interact with, and group B with the water that the psychologically ill people had handled and then he shows what happens when the plants grew, and it is mind blowing. Have you ever happened to have seen that book? No. Nope. Oh my God, you'd find it amazing. Blueprint for Immortality by Harold Saxon Burr. Well, the water on the plants from the psychologically ill people caused the plants to grow crooked. I don't know if you've ever seen picture of of what happens to plants that grow near negative ley lines where they how they get all gnarly yeah, and the, yeah. not only did they have all these weird entanglements but the leaves often grew down away from the sun and they looked just very sick they looked like they were depressed they looked like psychologically ill people so i was just curious what are your thoughts on the uh psychic uh capacity of water with this kind well, of this preset is, well what you do, uh, Paul, is that with your mind, you create also an electromagnetic field constantly. Otherwise, we couldn't think, and the mind cannot work. And your complete electromagnetic field around you has an effect upon water as well. If I give you water that is open for the environment, then it me immediately it takes over the environmental energy. So if you uh, give it into the hands of certain people, because it, it also works with people who have a certain disease. And uh, we have seen these effects on plants as well. So this is not really a surprise. It just tells you that any electromagnetic field, no matter how sensitive it is, if you give it for a longer period to water, then the water will respond to that. And that means it takes over a kind of crystalline form that can communicate with that specific field and energy level. And that energy level is then getting into the plant. Right. And, and then it becomes in formation. It directs the formation for better or worse. That's it. You have put data into the water. The, da the data is negative. So if you bring in negative, you get it out. Yeah, so if you put negative information in water, then you're going to get a negative gene expression. Yep, that's what you see. So this is, for me, not a real surprise. Yeah, it's very interesting. Now, there's probably other studies. I just happened to have run across that one because there's not too many that I've seen on the psychic effects on water. But it really bring for me, it brought up an important point, you see, because when I was a kid, my father was very abusive and eating at the dinner table, breakfast, lunch, or dinner was very stressful because you didn't know when he might slap you in the face for holding your fork wrong. Or, you know, he had, he was German. He had very strict table manners. He's my stepfather. And, um, 
I just was thinking after I read this research that, you know, the meal times need to be sacred because if people are under a lot of stress and kids are under a lot of stress, that's infusing that psychological energy into the water and it's infusing it into the water of the food they're eating. And, and that, that I think can really be a, a trigger for disease and, and, and also causes people to hold these traumas in their body until they figure out how to heal them. Which... Uh, Paul, what, what you're just telling is that you also create your own imprint on diseases because you are water. If your mind is constantly out of control, then the water into your body is getting at a certain level also getting out of control. Yes. And if you're in a state of love and That's empathy different. and compassion, then you're going to fill your water and you're outgassing water with every breath. So you're actually imprinting everybody with your harmony, not to mention the electromagnetic field you generate. Yes. Yeah, that's it. So uh, you are a walking machine, a computer machine, because you are 90% water molecule. And it responds to it. So a lot of the diseases uh, are coming from the mind as well. Absolutely. And that's why this whole psyop we're in is so dangerous because they're really using the mind to control people's choices, beliefs, and behaviors and create all sorts of manufactured fears. Uh, and that is why we are so pleased with this wand because the wand remains stable. Yes, I, th I think that's just incredible technology. And that's why I really wanted to make sure people knew about this tool because it's. I think it's got to be an essential ingredient, anybody's health toolkit, especially if you travel on airplanes and go through security systems and are near electrical grids. And, you know, that's almost everybody. A quick question I had before I forget. My studies in, on water have basically suggested that water is the most sensitive molecule in nature to the widest range of frequencies I was wondering, do you have any knowledge of exactly what the frequency range of water's receptivity is? Uh, what we have seen is that it uh, is probably beyond what we know in the world of physics. Okay, good. Yeah, so I, I've told people it's probably close to infinite. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't misleading them. No, that is, uh, I, I can approve it. But in many tests that we have done in the world of physics, then we went to print very very low frequencies uh very low one two three hertz yeah to the other uh, and even beyond that we see certain uh, aspects that we can hardly uh, understand we have seen for instance rhythms that uh, that uh, were in the water and we never uh, could recognize these rhythms they come from nature where they come from we haven't got a clue so it, it might be that it has a much wider range than what we know till now. Yes. Well, here's my last question for you. If you knew you were going to die tomorrow and you had this opportunity to give a message to the world, what would be your message you'd want everybody to get right now? The lesson I learned, Paul, is that we have to go back to nature as soon as possible and learn to respect nature. But for us, with the current state we are in, with the knowledge that we have, we have to study the rules of nature and respect them. Don't control them, but try to understand them and work with them. Nature is not against us. It is always with us. Yeah, it, well, it made us. <laughs> And it has its own rhythms. So try to find those rhythms and respect them. And uh, then I think we will change as humanity. And that is, uh, I think, uh, the lesson I learned. Yes, thank you. What a fantastic interview. Thank you for sticking in there with me for so long when it's so late at night for you. And and thank you for all your, your wisdom and your hard work and your research. And what a neat podcast because we got to start with AI and we've kind of been looking at the psychology, the psychic energy, the physical energy, the electromagnetic frequencies, the coherence, the stability, live water, dead water, the power of water, the power of consciousness, the state of the world, things we can do. I mean, this has just been like a tour de France of, of uh, spirit, you know, and, and life. So, well, Paul, Paul I think uh, you, uh, you gave, uh, 
you gave us time to have this fantastic discussion. I really appreciated it, and I look forward to have a new uh, discussion with you. Yeah, yeah, I'll be happy. Anytime you've got some new topics or ideas or anything you want to share, get a hold of me, and I'll, I'll get. We'll we'll have another powwow. We'll have another chief session. <laughs> okay. Just before you go, let's uh, any uh, websites that you want to direct people to anything else you want to share? Well, I think it would be fantastic if people want to have more information, let them go to the website on alamawater.com and there they can find a lot of the research and some of the feedbacks. And uh, we, uh, we still do a lot of research and every time when we do research in the world, we uh, put that on the website as well. So then they uh, are always informed upon the latest stuff that we do. Yes, thank you. And and Penny will be putting a code for you guys to use in the close of the podcast so you can get right there directly. And uh, thank you. Let's do this again. And uh, thank you for continuing to help wake people up in the world, Dolph. It's such a uh, such a pleasure to meet somebody like you. And, and, and uh, I, I really am grateful for everything you've done and are doing. You do the same as, we, uh, as I do, Paul. So uh, I wish you a very nice day and I hope to speak to you soon. Excellent. Have a great sleep. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Dolph Santinga. Visit the Analemma Water website at analemma-water.com. That's A-N-A-L-E-M-M-A-W-A-T-E-R. Dot com or connect via Facebook at Analemma Water or on Instagram at Analemma Water underscore. To get your own Analemma Water wand, go to bit.ly forward slash Analemma Water. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash A-N-A-L-E-M-M-A-W-A-T-E-R. Follow Paul Check on Instagram at Paul.Check, on Twitter at Paul Check, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. Watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to Check videos and more at the Check Institute's new media site, chekiva.com. Remember, you can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast.